Good afternoon, ladies. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Pastor Edna, for the opportunity to come and just share. I noticed that people are a bit nervous saying sex. <laughs> Can you just tell your neighbor sex? Okay. <laughs> like, it's, it's not a bad thing. And, and I guess we'll talk a little bit more about that and, and you'll get to hear where my passion comes from. So at the age of 16, I was very curious. I was curious about the wrong things. And uh, unfortunately, I, I, I got pregnant at 16, okay? So uh, my boyfriend was a matatu tout, okay? So I'm just checking off some things so that you guys just continue. What a, oh my God. <laughs> um, and I hid the pregnancy from my parents until I was eight months. Yeah, I know, I know. It's going to get Nini even more crazy, okay? Just get ready. Ask the Lord to prepare you. <laughs> anyway, so um, eight months. And so one day we've gone out for lunch and my mom, uh, I mean, my mom feeds us. It's Sunday, it's afternoon, it's hot. So I'm just like, I need to sit and just adjust my stomach because, you know, pregnant women, your stomach is very big, right? You need space. So I sat up and I shot my stomach. My stomach went up, boop, like this. My mom looked at me like, and I literally saw my life flash before me. I was just 16 and I was like, I am dying today. Jesus, come for me. I'm ready. When we got home, my mom beat the black out of me. I keep saying I'm the only light child in the family because of that day. And, um, you know, she kept asking, she's like, well, who, who, what, where, when, why? And I was like, yeah, ask yourself that question, perhaps, where were you? You didn't tell me about all of these things, you just used to tell me that boys are bad. But I'm like, why are they bad? So let me go and find out why they are bad. So, curiosity. And it was also peer pressure from high school, um, because the high school I was in, you know, we, we talked about, I mean, we like to come back home, I mean, school, um, from the weekend, talking about how, you know, we went to the Rev, or you kissed a man, or, or something, you know. And we're 16, I'm like, for God's sake, you were supposed to be studying, you know, focusing on your education, but I was focused on the wrong things. And unfortunately, that's what happened to me. So my parents had to make a very unfortunate decision and for three days, I was, they induced my delivery. And at 16, it's death. I remember it was the worst experience. And I keep saying we should never permit a child to give birth. Like a, a child's pelvic area and just her reproductive area is just not ready for that trauma, I call it. And... That was a time when I really, I cast my parents. I said they're the worst, they don't love me. And that began my journey downhill. And I just said, you know what, these people don't love me. They left me in a clinic somewhere in Kasarani. They didn't even know how I was doing. My mother came to visit me only once. I was going through pain. If you know labor pains, ladies, 16, my pelvic had refused to open, it had refused. In fact, the doctor said one day, we're going to lose her. He was nervous. But that was just curiosity, my curiosity, mine. So I got very angry with my parents. I remember when they got me out of the clinic, the same day I was taken home, changed, and I went back to school, to class, as though nothing had happened. Stop pretending like you guys have never done such things with your kids as though nothing has happened and life just moves on, by the way. But that's what happened for me. And after that, like, it... Like, my path was just so dark. I was headed for hell. I fast forward till I was 31. By the time I was 31, <laughs> I, I was like the party animal, the life of the party. I used, we used to drink from Monday to Monday, you know. You were the one who guys used to call like, eh, hey, so where is, it? where is it happening today? After Jobo, guys are just like, eh, hey, Elsie, where are we going? You know, for the five o'clock, 
drink until nine o'clock, then we go home. Anybody wants to say amen? Like, feel me? Am I alone? Am I alone? <laughs> so that's what happened. And guys, I, I had sex with more than 100 men by the time I was 31 because I was looking for love. I was looking for affirmation. I was looking for someone to validate me, just make me feel like, you know what, you're enough, Elsie. I hated my parents. I hated them so much. I worked very hard to fail. Please note, I'm a brilliant student, but I, fa I failed in everything. And the time when it came for me to actually take my certificate for university, telling my dad, I've done well, he said, I don't care. I wouldn't be proud of you because of your behavior. I'm like, sour. <laughs> Go, you find the other dudes who will love you. So it was wrong. But I met Jesus. I met Jesus and I call myself beautifully broken. There is no failure, there is no mess that is too big for Jesus to fix. It doesn't matter how unworthy, how filthy you are, he's in the business of restoring the broken. He's in his element when you come to him and you require to be fixed. His business is for the broken. He came for those who have been, cap uh, have been uh, held hostage, who have been captives. He came to restore the brokenhearted. Ladies, if you're here and you're struggling with your shame from your sexual failure, Jesus is the only answer for you. So that's where I went with my sexual encounters. Then I met Jesus when I was 31. Then I had to deal with all my sins. And then I was like, oh my God, you know what? First and foremost, I go to church. I can't lift up my hands. Because I'm just like, I can see the dudes I was with. And there are some chicks who knew my life when I was, you know? So I'd like to tell you this, ladies. Your past is exactly where it is in there. It has no business being in the present. Jesus has already saved, he's already died, he's risen. He is on, seated at the right hand of his father. He's pleading for you. He has no business coming back to die again. Ladies, come on. If you experience sexual failure, you don't have to take Jesus back to the cross over and over again, telling him, I don't feel worthy, I don't deserve it, all those things. He's already died, imagine. Let's move on, okay? But you see, we live in an age that is very sexualized. Everywhere we go, everywhere we look, ads, we're selling oil for God's sake. You're wondering, dude, why is that dude over there undressing? It's that oil company, what was it called, that ad? Do you remember it? Hey, it was so hot, I was just like, hello, this is on national TV. I'm just like, what's going on? Our, you know, the music videos, okay? Okay, ladies, put up your hand. The umpire watchers, please, just put up your hands. We know you. We follow you on social media. We know you. Game of Thrones. How much nudity is in those programs? And you're sitting there telling yourself, this is okay. It is not. You're objectifying a human being. What that will do to you is it will set you up, and rather set up the other person as an object. Now you'll come to me with questions like, but can't I test drive for? Did Eve and Adam test drive? No. Okay. Story, Mekwisha. We move on. If you keep consuming that content, it will erode the compassion and the genuine love that God has put in your heart and turn it into lust. Lust destroys 
the identity of a man. Lust objectifies a man and a woman. It turns you into something that then I want to take from. Love gives. Love protects. Love covers your shame. The minute I am sexually immoral with another human being or my own hands, hello? I know we don't like going there. We don't think that girls can sin. And we don't think that, we, don't, we never like having that conversation that women masturbate. But the highest consumers of pornography in our country is women. There's data. And your smartphones, ask your neighbor, can I check your browser, your history? Come on, ladies. Let's have some honest conversations. Give your phone, if you're brave enough. And the problem, the issue that we have today is that there is no accountability. So for me, I had accountability. The only problem was I was bragging about my conquests. And I will call them that because every Monday I used to come to Jobo and say, Ma, guys, I was this guy, finished him, massacred him, you know, all those things. You know, because I'm over there trying to prove myself. But we think as women that we are not bad, that we're not evil, that we cannot sin, yet we do. We experience sexual failure, we do, ladies, and it's okay. But here's the thing, in accountability, provide a safe space for your sister. When she's coming to confess, don't judge her. Because they keep saying, you know, there are girls who come for my purity and purpose program, and then they say, you know, no, me, I've never had sex, I've never done all those things, so I don't even know why this class is important for me. I'm like, be careful that you think you're standing lest you fall. It can happen. And I'm not saying like that's God's plan for you, his will and purpose for your life, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 to 7, talks about his will for our lives is to live sexually pure lives. That's his will for our lives. But we've made the plan for our lives. Our mission is to get married and have sex. It's everything today, Manze. On everyone's post, goals, those photo shoots of couples, engagement, rings, whatnot, on the hill, on the mountain, a helicopter. N next, did you know that consu this, this consumerism around weddings and just why the industry has grown was driven by magazines? Did you know that? They put all the suppliers, wedding suppliers, rings, dresses, destinations, all of those things, dinner places, everything. And every year the magazines are getting thicker and thicker and thicker. It was impossible to walk around with one. Because what? They are actually, there's someone who needs to benefit from your desire. They put pressure on you. So you, when the guy comes to you, you're like, so where's my ring? Oh, okay. You're like, it's not like I did that. You know, but I told you, like, I wanted that ring. You know, that one? The rock with the weight. You know, I digress. Oh, my God. The, so we have to make sure, one, that we guard our hearts. So watch what you're consuming. Don't take it for granted. The Bible says flee. It uses that term, I think about nine times in the Bible. We're not being told to stroll, flee from sexual immorality. I uh, found my point. Thank you, Jesus. So now, we've made our will that. We've idolized marriage. And the benefit for us, it's not even about the person that we're going to spend our life with. It's about, it's become the benefits. It's become how, what if I'm not compatible with them? What if I don't like them? Then you have a list. Ladies, your journal. Can I just check your journals and see, like, there's two pages of the guy. 
Like, Lord, he has to be told that handsome, financially, uh, a financial steward, a man who loves the Bible, speaks in tongues, Sharabosh. I want a man who will lead me to the Lord. Eh, eh. The Bible says, work out your own salvation. Did it say, Adam, work out Eve's salvation? No, it's your salvation. Pressure on the men. Why do you think the men are running away from us? They're like, these women are impossible. And it's real. I'm, I'm, I'm keeping it real with you because I speak a lot and I, and I meet these young men. They're just like, they are, they are ready, ripe for marriage. However, it's just the pressure. It's too much. These women, apana. I have to drive to which car? I have to have an iPhone, you know. Buy them an iPhone also when I ask them to marry them. You know, there's too much pressure. However, the pursuit of sexual purity will unlock your purpose. Why? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things shall be added unto you. We only know that scripture until seek first the kingdom of God and all these things. We always forget and his righteousness. Righteousness talks to purity. Righteousness talks to holiness. We are set apart. We are a chosen generation. Why would we not want to treat ourselves as that? And why wouldn't we? Why would we want? Remember how Joseph responded to um, Pot Potiphar's wife? Remember what he said to, you know, he's like, like me, I sin against my God. Like it's just, it's absolutely not, it's out of the picture. I'd rather die than sin against my God. But we negotiate with sin, we negotiate with sexual sin. Yet the Bible is telling us, flee, run, don't look back, forget it. If an, if an animal right now, if a bear came right now to you, would you just sit there like, hey? <laughs> the enemy is not playing. His intention is to steal, kill, destroy. We think he's here to play, he's not. And for me, I knew that something was at stake. At that 31, I kept lifting up my hands and praying. I said, God, just hide my shame. I don't care what's happening here in church. And he showed me my purpose. And I kept saying, I'm so tired of being unable to lift my hands, like genuinely, like I really want to praise you and worship you. But I don't want to feel like the eyes of judgment. But I, I really want to praise you. And he says to me, Elsie, I'm calling you to go and walk with another woman. Help her navigate the path of sexual purity. Help her overcome her shame. Because I have come. I have come for those. Me have not come for those who are well. Those who are well, they can stand aside. Jesus Christ came for the sick. Those who are broken. Those who are hurting. He came for those. So for me, that's how I unlocked my purpose. So that's when I was 31. By that time, I was praying, I was fasting, I was saying, Lord, the man, please, I'm serving you. Okay, I'm over here serving you, Lord, faithfully. I have given of my time. I have quit Jobo. I have even left corporate. I'm doing my internship now at Mavuno Church. I'm being raised as a pastor. I'm like, Lord, remember your servant, like Nehemiah. Do not pass me by, Lord Jesus. Do not forget me. It became painful. It became painful. I hated bridal showers. My God, I used to be called at bridal. I'm just like, there's no way. What? I go see another girl being loved on, being, you know, doing, doing all those things. I'm like, okay, then. Me? No. Okay. Moving on. Year one, year two, year three, year four, eh, year five, what? Six, eh, Lord. I can't. Me, <laughs> Missy, Wezi. But he told me, Elsie, you've idolized this thing. Look at me. Lift my eye. Lift your eyes to me. Look to me. I'm the one who's going to fulfill my purpose through you. You're not even the one who's going to accomplish it. So stop even just celebrating, saying how you're serving me. You're serving me, but you're coming with terms and conditions for me. Ladies, ask yourself, are your prayers motivated by your own selfishness? You want this man so fast, bad, you fasted but you cannot even fast for this country. K 
Kenya is the sixth leading country with the highest HIV and AIDS infection amongst the teenagers. Where is our future workforce? The enemy is not playing, but these things will not be put on like the main news. No, and it'll come only once. At the end of the year, December 1, that is the only time you will hear about HIV status. And then it'll be like a small paragraph, okay? But it's news, my friend. If the future workforce of this country is being compromised, you and I should be concerned. The responsibility for having conversation about sex is not the pastors. It's not programs like Purity and Purpose. It's on you as a parent. Are you nervous about having sex, uh, uh, conversations about sex with your child? There are programs you can actually do that are online that will empower you. Godly conversation. I'm not talking about the other stuff, the other websites. But you can unlock content that can enable you to have these conversations with your children. And for me, that's how I unlocked my purpose. And I am so proud because Purity and Purpose just began as a conversation online. And I just said, hey, who, who's interested in just doing Purity and Purpose? And so far, I think I've worked with over like 130 women um, over like nine seasons. And it's hard for these women to come forth, by the way, because, again, there's so much shame. Like, guys don't want to, they don't want to get, I, I keep saying, they don't want to get better because they're afraid of the shame. They're afraid of being, you know, us pointing fingers at them. Because let me tell you something, we will finish this meeting right now and then you will go and sit in a corner and then say, my word, did you hear what Elsie was saying? Well, let me tell you, mm, I shall become the topic of your conversation. Ask yourself, like David did, search my heart, O Lord. Show me my wicked ways. Have you been candid enough to ask your, con your father the conversation? Show me my wicked ways. I'm evil. I am capable of sinning. But you're more than able to restore me. You're, he shelters the righteous, ladies. He does. He shelters you. When you flee, he will cover you. So at 37, I met this man. So I thought I was like, I couldn't keep my face straight. And I was like, why can't I keep a straight face with this guy? First and foremost, does he know who I am? I lead a ministry. I lead the Endometriosis Foundation of Kenya. I'm an important woman. At Unilever, I'm the one who leads this social mission business. I'm an important woman. Does he know who I am? That time you're trying to be tough. Kumbe Yoku. Finished. <laughs> and this guy comes and I ask, Lord, if, you know, if it is him, show me. And God says, I am not even involved in the decision about who you marry. You know that the only time I get involved is when you invoke my name, when you're saying, I do. That's the only time that God is involved in your decision. Because you're making a covenant. I got married at 38. So ladies, I would like to assure you that you will not die, okay? <laughs> you won't die. My ovaries, unfortunately, I'm experiencing premature ovarian failure. So my chances of conceiving as a result of endometriosis is not going to happen. But guess what the enemy tried to do? I felt so bad and I kept saying it was because of that abortion. And now I'm being punished. Hey. That's not, God is not in the business of punishing you, ladies and gentlemen. If you've already acknowledged him as Lord and Savior, he's already paid for your sins. And that's why I love Jesus. Like, I, I, I just, me, I have no problem sharing my sexual failure with you, ladies. My hope is that you will not enter the same trap and allow for your purpose and your destiny to be robbed by the enemy. 
the world is waiting in eager expectation for the revelation of the true sons and daughters of God. Will you arise and follow your purpose? Will you arise and live your purpose? This country of ours is suffering because there are not enough men and women who are rising up to take their position in the different sectors of society just because you're so stressed about what you did last night or who says and did what and knows what about you, all that is irrelevant. God can turn your pain into purpose. He can turn your mess into a beautiful message. And that's what happens when you give him your heart. The effects of sexual sin are so intrinsic. Look at your neighbor. Can you tell whether they had sex last night or were watching pornography? I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering, ladies. The effects of sexual sin are intrinsic. You will never know a woman is struggling until she opens her mouth. Ladies, open your mouths and cry out to the Lord and repent. The context for which sex was made was marriage. And for me, I... I used to think like I'll be excited about having sex with my husband, you know, because I, used, I had experiences, so I knew what it was. So I was like, yes. On the night, I was just like, why don't we just sleep? Like, it was difficult. But guess what? The enemy had robbed my innocence. Don't allow that. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, do not soil the marriage bed. And that's what sexual, living a sexually immoral life will do. And it's not only physical sex, also virtual sex. It robs it and it takes it away. Give God the chance to be glorified in your marriage bed. In your marriage bed, not in your bed with your boyfriend who has no even legal jurisdiction over you. By the time you get married, you'll have a line of people. Soul ties. And people think that those things are jokes. When you're having dreams, sexual dreams, erotic ones, you're engaging with the spiritual realm, with demonic spirits, because that's what you do. You open a door a door that should only be for your husband. Marriage is the, is the thing that replicates the relationship that Jesus Christ has with the church. And why would your temple, your body, the temple, be the temple for other spirits? When the Bible says, offer yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing. Your body is a temple of the Lord. You've been bought for a price. He's already died for you. When a jama tries to come and ingiza you box and danganyang and tell you all those nice things, that you know, oh, girls will like to hear those things, by the way. <laughs> but if he does that and he's not under the authority of Christ, that first is your, should be your sign. Don't play with fire. Run, flee. And don't even apologize. We shouldn't apologize for serving the sovereign God, the majestic God who deserves the glory, the honor. But I know that there is someone who probably will never be able to forgive themselves, who's not able to forgive themselves, so they're not a virgin. In this country, there are no more virgins by the age of 20. Please, no. It's like virginity is like a, it's like you're boring if you're a virgin. It used to be cool. Guard your heart, for from it flows the issues of life. And we've normalized sexual immorality through the music we're listening to, the content we're watching. And, and it's okay, and our kids are just around us, and they're watching all of this content. How do we protect the generation that is coming after us? It's up to you and I, ladies. Um, 
but yeah, I'm, I, I'm here just to encourage someone who, who feels like a failure. Imagine Jesus loves you and he can forgive. So with that, 